Now that we've seen the Hamiltonian for the hydrogen molecule, our next order of business is to look at an approximation which is going to help us to be able to solve for the wave functions and energies of molecules. So we had our total Hamiltonian here. We had two nuclear kinetic energy terms, kinetic energy of nucleus A, nucleus B, uh, kinetic energy of electron one and electron two, and then we had all six uh, pairwise interactions due to Coulomb's law and these uh, four charged particles here. So we have four electron nuclear attraction terms, the, the attraction of electron one to nucleus A and nucleus B, the, the attraction of electron two to nucleus A and nucleus B. We have one term, which is the repulsion of electrons. So this one over R12 term, one term, which is the repulsion of the two nuclei, this one over RAB. Okay, so now given that, what can we do to help solve this equation? Well, we can't solve this Schrodinger equation exactly as is, so we're going to have to make some kind of approximation. And the first approximation which is usually made in quantum chemistry is called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And basically, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation says that the mass of nuclei is much, much greater than the mass of the electron. So that means that relative to the electrons, the nuclei can be stationary. Thus, the kinetic energy of the nuclei is taken to be zero. So that means that our kinetic energy of nucleus A and nucleus B is just going to be set to zero and we're going to ignore these terms. <clears throat> And that also makes our life easier for the nuclear-nuclear repulsion because now this term just becomes a simple algebraic formula. It's just whatever distance, whatever positions we place nucleus A and nucleus B at, RAB is going to be a constant throughout, um, the entire, uh, throughout the entire calculation of what this wave function is. Okay, so this is essentially a type of separation of variables technique because um, what we're doing here is we're saying that our total wave function, which depends on the coordinates of electron 1, electron 2, nucleus A, and nucleus B, can be broken down into a product of an electronic wave function, which depends explicitly on the position of electron 1 and electron 2. And it depends parametrically on the positions of the nuclei, Ra and Rb. So by putting this semicolon here and then RA and RB after that, I'm saying that the position of nucleus A and nucleus B is fed in as a parameter to this equation, but it is not an explicit variable. The variables are the positions of electron 1 and electron 2, which are free to move, whereas the nuclei are merely fixed at a position of my choosing. And then this is multiplied by a nuclear wave function, which is just a function of position of nucleus A and nucleus B. Okay, so a total wave function is a product of an electronic wave function and a nuclear wave function. That looks pretty close to the standard separation of variables type arguments that we've been making uh, thus far. Okay, so that means that we have a, an electronic Schrodinger equation we're going to have H electronic for our electronic wave function, which is going to depend on R1 and R2. I'm going to omit these parameters now for RA and RB equals our electronic energy times psi of R1, R2. Okay, so the Schrodinger equation that we're generally trying to solve for uh, molecules is going to be an electronic Schrodinger equation. We're trying to solve for the wave functions of just the electrons and we're assuming that the nuclei are either classical particles or we're going to go back and solve for their wave functions later once we've solved for this wave function of the electrons. Okay, so then um, just to make it more explicit and remind ourselves the electronic Hamiltonian is just going to be kinetic energy of the electrons minus one half del squared one, del squared two. And then we're going to have the attraction of the electrons to the nuclei, minus one over Ra. Remember the charge of nucleus A and nucleus B is each one 
for uh, the hydrogen molecule. If this wasn't hydrogen, Z A and Z B would not be one, and we would have to include their value in this numerator here for these nuclear attraction terms. Oh, one attracted to A, one attracted to B, two attracted to A, and two attracted to B. Okay, and then we have, of course, the electrons repel each other. Then you'll have to watch sometimes, whoop, what am I doing here? Going off, going off course. Okay, whoa, and we're back. All right, so sometimes uh, people include the final term of the repulsion of the nuclei in there in the electronic Hamiltonian. Sometimes they don't. Um, you'll just have to pay attention to your specific course for whether they want you to include that term or not. Um, I'm going to include it. Since this is just a constant, it doesn't affect what the wave functions are. It just affects the energy. It's a constant which is going to add to the total energy then at the end. And then basically, for our uh, electronic Schrodinger equation here, then this energy becomes a potential energy function, which depends on, because our electronic energy is then going to depend on what our initial choices were for RA and RB. So we can then plug this into a nuclear Schrodinger equation where our Hamiltonian, our nuclear Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy of ZA of of nucleus A and nucleus B, and our potential energy is the electronic energy, which depends on those coordinates. So we could say something like the following, where we could say our nuclear Hamiltonian is, let's say, minus one half over mass of the nucleus del squared A minus. 1 over mass of nucleus B, del squared B, and then plus our potential energy is going to be our electronic energy, which is a function of the coordinates of those two nuclei. And then we would have some, uh, then we would have some nuclear wave function as well. You can have H nuke psi nuke function of R A and R B equals, then we're going to have our nuclear energy, sine nuke RARB. So if we want to go back and solve for our wave functions then on the potential energy surface, which is caused by our electrons, we can go back and do that. But what is often done is that the nuclei are just treated as classical particles, and this gives rise to the standard uh, molecular potential energy surface that we're used to. So a potential energy surface requires the Born-Oppenheimer approximation to make any sense, because without assuming that the nuclei are fixed relative to the electrons, that the electrons move much faster and relax to their lower, lowest energy much faster than the nuclei, then we don't have concepts like potential energy surfaces and things like that.